Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. We're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 metre amateur radio band and streaming live to my YouTube channel VK3CSJ and also via the Melbourne television repeater VK3RTV digital channel 1 in full HD and we have a email address going if anybody wishes to send reports you can write to VK3 C, um, EKH at gmail.com VK3EKH at gmail.com And we've also got the chat window up and running to the Discord chat window. So if you wish to join the Discord chat room, you may do so. On this 7th of July, I very much welcome everybody who's tuned in at this point of the time. And hope everybody is in good spirits and trying to keep warm. We're uh, certainly getting a bit of a, a blast at the moment. And uh, the wind is uh, averaging around, I think, 40. Yep, there it is, 40 kilometres an hour. Coming in from the northwest. So she's, um, she's pretty windy outside. Uh, it's likely to be like that for uh, all of uh, tomorrow too, I believe. Anyway, welcome to tonight's session. Let's hope we can get this uh, over and done with fairly quickly tonight. Um, <laughs> oh, coffee, coffee. Okay, we have Sky Notes for July to present in the first part. Oh, actually, what I will do, uh, my usual story first. I've almost forgot. Almost forgot. <clears throat> Um, okay, this is my uh, vocal warming up uh, procedure. And yeah, all right. The Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922 and comprises well over 1,600 members scattered about Australia and overseas. Membership of the society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of which each month coming up next Wednesday, except in January, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm in the Mullio Hall, National Herbarium, in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, the, the Melbourne Observatory, which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. The aim is to try and finish by 10 o'clock with proceedings and there is coffee and tea available afterwards with pickies courtesy of the AV, um, AV, AV, ASV. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory, receipt of the ASV magazine Crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings with weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm Equatorial Reflector and a 300mm Portable Reflector. There's also a 200mm Refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a Photoheliograph are also housed at the Observatory and are accessible to members as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm Reflectors available for short period loan. So members can try before they buy concept. 
Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90-minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger two only with appropriate training, uh, which range from 300 to 1,000 mm in aperture. Also located on the side is a 8.5 radio telescope, fully steerable, which means which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make use of the uh, of, um, to make and use telescopes. Advice and on help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Uh, there are a number of sections that make up the ASV. In alphabetical order, you have the astrophotography section, the club section, comet and meteor section, computing section, cosmology and astrophysics section, deep sky section, historical section, instrument making, juniors, lunar and planetary, new radio, um, new astronomers group, <laughs> radio astronomy, solar astronomy, space exploration. And the newly uh, new section uh, called Women in the ASV. So uh, they are 21. Uh, actually, what happened to this one? Did I read out one there? Um, hang on, I'm just checking my. Yeah, I did read it out. It's okay, just checking that. All right, so if any of those sections uh, are of any interest to you, the best thing probably to do is uh, to uh, go to the Sections tab on the ASV website and look under the Sections tab, which I just did, and go through all those sections, find out the, each, each section open When you click on uh, the section, it opens up to a new page, a bit of a description of uh, the, the section, and there should be contact details for the section director on those pages. And if any of those sections sound interesting to you, you're more than welcome to contact the section director, find out a suitable time that um, uh, that you can sit in, join in on a Zoom meeting, or perhaps visit the uh, um, the uh, the new meeting room in Melbourne and uh, see if it's all uh, all up your alley. And if it is, then uh, uh, you can join and um, be part of the uh, the team, so to speak. Anyway. Um, the um, if you wish to write to the secretary for more information or to join, uh, you can write to that is to write to the ASV. You can write to the secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box ten fifty nine, Melbourne, Victoria, three thousand and one. Otherwise, you can go to the website www.asv.org.au, and all will be revealed. Uh, the ASV will conform to all government health directives. Directives ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed as a result. Uh, but uh, ASV do a great job in, in keeping all members informed of what's going on. There's a, a monthly or regular uh, email that comes out called Crux Extra, uh, which is every, comes out every other week just to let people uh, remind people of what's happening, what's coming up in the week and uh, of events, so uh, all very good. So that's the ASV in a nutshell, and that's just what this broadcast is on behalf of since 1988. So uh, here we are again. Okay, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, and uh, we're coming to you from Nary Warren. Uh, okay, very pleasant good evening to... Just checking on the uh, the chat window. Um, let me see. Um, all right, we've got. Uh, I thought I saw Nebs there, Mr. Cassiopeia. What happened to you? Um, operating on a different mouse here. Anyway, I see that uh, uh, Brendan O'Brien is there. G'day, Brendan. He's giving a bit of a plug for his uh, Astrophys website astrophys.com which I was going to give a plug off anyway halfway through tonight and uh, Martin VK7JH is there and uh, let's see if I can just go down to the bottom of the page which is where I was oh Struth um, 
Yeah. Okay, just uh, cursing, cursoring, cursing down to the bottom of the page. There it is. Good. Remus. Good day, Remus. And Steve, VK3SPX. Welcome, gentlemen. And looking at the email, we have Andrew, VK3KIS, checking in. 5 and 9 on 80. And uh, Steve says, uh, good to see 80 minutes back to normal. Oh, that's excellent. Yes, I was paying attention to the the uh, HEP chart um, before, um, which gives you a bit of a prediction of what's going on. And uh, certainly the uh, um, the colour spectrum across Tasmania and Victoria at the moment are favouring uh, 3 to 4 megs at the moment. And I was hearing a number of VK2s and VK5s on before, so I know the, the propagation is there tonight, at least. Uh, Sky Notes, courtesy of Tanya Hill, the uh, resident astronomer at the Planetarium at Science Works in Melbourne. And thank you, Tanya, for the Sky Notes for July 2023. And she kicks off by saying that she's, um, yeah, there's a little bit of advertising for the Planetarium there. Um, if you, um, I know it's almost, uh, school holidays are almost over, um, but uh, the Planetarium would have been a, a good place, or is a good place to go to uh, for the kids. And uh, um, so uh, be, be mindful of that, just to go to the Science Museum website and look out for the Planetarium and uh, you'll be able to find out what's happening at the Planetarium and Science Works in general. <laughs> All right. Uh, she starts off by uh, saying it's the um, Epithelion time. Epithelion. <laughs> the first word I trip over. It's uh, in its elliptical orbit, Earth reaches its annual furthest point from the Sun uh, this month, known as the Aphelion, uh, when we will be 5 million kilometres more distant than our closest point, which occurred in January. And she says, see the planet section for more details. So we're getting to a point where the, we're the furthest point from the sun. And uh, I suspect it's about right with the way the weather is at the moment. Okay, sunrise and sunset times. Uh, yeah, I'll start off from the 1st of July. From Saturday the 1st of July, the sun rose at 7.36 and set at 5.11. By Tuesday the 11th, uh, it will rise at 7.34, setting at 5.16. On Friday the 21st, it will set rise at 7.26 and uh, set at 5.23. And then by the end of the month, Monday the 31st, it will rise, the sun will rise at 7.21 a.m. and set at 5.31 p.m. So those mornings are getting ever increasingly uh, brighter. Thank goodness for that. Moon phases for this month. There will be a full moon on Monday the 3rd of July, been and gone. There's a third quarter on the 10th, Monday the 10th. And there's a new moon on Tuesday the 18th. And then there's a first quarter phase on the 26th of July, Wednesday. Now, as far as moon distances go, there's a lunar perigee, or closest to the Earth, on Wednesday the 5th, been and gone. And she was uh, uh, 360,149 kilometres. I think it was a blue moon, too. I, I think they considered it a, a blue moon on Wednesday. I think that was the uh, what was going on. Uh, and uh, then on Thursday the 20th, the moon will be furthest from the Earth, apogee, uh, at 406,289 kilometres. Now, let's have a quick breakdown of the planets. Mercury is not visible early in the month, being too close to the sun. After having moved behind the sun through superior conjunction, conjunction sorry, uh, but by the end of July, it will be visible again, but at dusk, low in the northwest from 6 p.m. before setting at 7.30 p.m. Once again, I always say, if you've never seen Mercury 
because you've had this idea that Mercury is the closest planet to the sun and therefore not visible, there are times of the year when you can see it above the horizon. And this is one of them. So, uh, like I say, by the end of July, it will be visible again at dusk, low in the northwest, uh, from 6 p.m., from after 6 o'clock, after the sun has set. And you'll see it there. Use uh, Stellarium. If you haven't uh, haven't heard of Stellarium, Stellarium is a uh, uh, a program that allows you to uh, to look at all objects in the sky. It charts everything from satellites to celestial objects, uh, and uh, it uh, fasts forward thousands of years into the future and thousands of years in the past, so you can see what the sky was like at any time. And, uh, but it's a, uh, a planetarium in your hand, you know, on a mobile phone uh, app. It's a Stellarium. It's a wonderful program to, uh, to be able to see what's in the sky right at this very moment and uh, when to uh, see what's coming up. So, having said that, yeah, so like I say, there's a chance to see Mercury. Short and sweet. Venus continues as the evening star. In the northwest, visible from 5.30 p.m., I think that is. She's only typed in 5.3 p.m., so I'll make that 5.30 p.m. And setting by 8 p.m. It has um, just passed its greater elongation east, uh, its furthest angular separation from the sun as seen from Earth. And as far as Earth is concerned, Earth reaches its aphelion, aphelion, which is furthest from the Sun, <clears throat> as mentioned before, on the 7th of July. That's today, in fact. So we are actually travelling, at this point in time, the furthest from the Sun, which feels like it, <laughs> like I said before. Um, we're at a distance of 152 million uh, 93,251 kilometres, you could almost throw a stone. By comparison, the uh, Perilithion, which is closest to the sun for 2023, was on January the 5th at 147,098,925 kilometres, just a little closer. Some 5 million kilometres closer, in fact. Our Elliptical orbit results from the gravitational influences of the Sun and other planets, but principally by the Moon. Only one other planet, Pluto, has such a uh, has uh, has such a proportionately large moon with its major major moon Charon, uh, which together could almost be considered a double planet. She reckons. Um, the 5 million kilometre difference from Perithelion to Aphelion, my God, can be seen in a 3% change in the Sun's apparent diameter as observed from Earth. The Otago Museum in Griffith provided a clear example which featured as an astronomy picture of the day for the 9th of January in 2020. Pardon me. Mars is visible uh, from 6 p.m. in the northwest at dusk before setting by 8.30 p.m. The red planet is not as bright uh, object as the distance is currently 326 million kilometres. Uh, when at its closest, it can be 50, 55 million kilometres. And um, uh, so, yes, there it is. Jupiter is an early object seen from 2 a.m. in the northeast before fading from view in the early dawn light. That's the object we're seeing early in the moon, early in the morning. Uh, Saturn can be seen pale and yellow from 10 p.m. in the east and across the north during the night before being lost in the west by 7 a.m. Elongations and conjunctions. And there's a little graphic I'm going to bring up on the page here, uh, on the screens, I should say. So let's, let's just bring that up right now before I start continuing on with that. Um, hmm. Hmm. Oh, well, I didn't bring it acro 
across. There's always one one image that I don't bring across into vMix. It's so annoying because I'm sure I did. Oh well, here it is for those watching video. God, it's a fun night tonight. Right. Uh, like I say, elongations and conjunctions. For the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, as viewed from the Earth, there is an angular separation in our skies between them and the Sun. This is called their elongation, in the sense that their position elongates away from the Sun as they orbit. At their greatest elongation, they appear furthest from the Sun as seen from the Earth. However, when they move behind the Sun, their elongation is zero, and this is called the superconjunction, in that they are at the greatest distance from Earth and appear co-joined in or conjoined in the sky with the Sun. When they pass in front of the Sun, they are not visible but are at inferior conjunction and are at their least distance from us, again joined with the sun in our daytime sky and the graphic on the screen kind of illustrates that thank you Tanya above or the diagram that you're seeing <laughs> uh, is an ESO diagram and a European Space uh, Organization uh, diagram depicting an inner planet Mercury or Venus at elongation and conjunction as if looking down on their orbits these refer to a planet's position as the Sun from Earth, seen from Earth and in relation to the Sun. Western elongation occurs in our pre-dawn skies in the east and eastern elongation in our viewing skies in the west. You have to look at this diagram to understand all that. Uh, an outer planet, Mars, is also known as uh, is also shown but at opposition on the opposite side of Earth to the Sun. At opposition, it is a nighttime object closest to us and at its brightest. So there it is. Interesting little graphic to show on the screen there for those watching YouTube and uh, the ATV repeater. Um, okay. That's just a few links she's provided there. Meteors, meteors, meteors. This month we have uh, no strong meteor showers, but on the 27th to the 30th of July there is the Southern Delta Acarids, uh, which um, should be v should be visible in the constellation of Aquarius and uh, the water bearer high in the north. The meteors will radiate from the near Scat Delta Aquari. It's a Latin word there. Uh, the north brightest star in the constellation. The, the best time to look is a few hours before dawn and perhaps 20 meteors per hour could be seen. So that's between the 20th and the 30th of July. The southern Delta Aquarids in the constellation of Aquarius. Stars and constellations. For the viewing, for the evening viewing at a local astronomical twilight, at, at local astronomical twilight, uh, when the sun is between 12 and 18 degrees below the western horizon, at this time and depending on the weather and the degree of light pollution, most visible celestial objects can be seen with the unaided eye. In the west, Kansas Major and Cirrus, the brightest of the nighttime stars, is much lower this month in the west. In the north, high in the north is Virgo and Star Spicer, while Leo is in the northwest recognizable by its upside down hook pattern of stars with the star Regulus. Looking towards the east, we've got Scorpius rises much higher in the southeast with the red giant star Antares easily seen even from areas with city lights. Below and now fully revealed is the Centaur Archer Centaurus Sagittarius whose bow and arrow forms the famous Asterum the teapot. 
Looking south, the Southern Cross or Crux is high up directly south and to the left are the pointers Alpha and Beta Centauri which mark the front hooves of the other celestial centaur. The billions of distant stars and numerous dust, dark, dust clouds of the Milky Way forms a broadband of, across the evening sky from east to west. From our southern perspective, we enjoy a superb view of the galaxy quite different to most northern hemisphere locations. It's um, easy to see in the southwest are the intriguing irregular shaped neighboring galaxies, the large and small clouds of Magellan, which are special features of our southern sky. And visible are the bright stars Canopus in the southwest and Anaka, Akana, closer to the horizon in the south, also visible. The International Space Station orbits every 90 minutes at an average distance of 400 kilometers, appearing like a fast, bright star moving across the sky. And here are some bright object times for this month. There is a passing on Wednesday the 5th of January, been and gone. Then there was a passing tonight at 6.12pm to 6.23pm. So if you happen to see it between clouds, that was it. Then on the morning of the 19th of July, Wednesday the 19th of July at 6.42 to 6.49, it will be a passing coming in from the north west northwest to the southeast and then on the 20th of July Thursday the 20th at 5:55 to 5:59 coming in from the north northwest to the southeast again uh, you can check heavens above website the heavens above website is equally as good to to see what's up in the sky and what's when it will uh, appear uh, as i as as the stellarium program is all right, now we zip to some dates. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. <clears throat> on this day, on the 1st of January 1770, closest pass to Earth of any known comet was Comet Lexel at 2.2 million kilometres, roughly 5.5 times the moon distance. That was uh, the 1st of July, 1770. I don't think I've heard that one before. 1770, what a year. Closest pass to Earth of any known comet, Comet Lexel, L-E-X-E-L-L, Lexel, at 2.2 million kilometres. That would have been a, a fairly nice object in the sky. Um, on the 4th of July, in the year 1054, Chinese and other astronomers witnessed the supernova explosion that produced the Crab Nebula some 6,500 light years away. On the, also on the 4th of July 2005, Deep Impact Probe USA crashes into Comet Temple 1 to analyse its composition. Also on the 4th of July 1868, is the birth of Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who established the luminosity period relationship of Cepheid variable stars, allowing Edward Hubble to show nebulae, 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 uh, where other galaxies beyond were other galaxies beyond our own. Good on you, Henrietta. 1868. On the 5th of July, 1687. Isaac Newton's Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy is published, laying the groundwork for much of the modern science. On the 5th of July, 1687, Isaac Newton's Mathematical Principles... Haven't I just... I just read that out, didn't I? Well, there it is. On the 7th of July, 1959, Venus... Diameter is determined and its atmosphere analysed by its occultation of star Regulus in Leo. Okay, 1959. On the 8th of July 2011, the Space Shuttle Atlantis is launched on the final mission for the shuttle program. 2011 that was. That's not that long ago. July 10, 1962. 1962, first communications satellite Telstar USA is launched 
as an experiment in transatlantic communication. And uh, there's a few more dates, but I'll finish on this one. Uh, on the 11th of July, 1979, Skylab 1 is destroyed during a re-entry over Western Australia and scatters debris over a wide area. area. All right, I'll continue on with the rest of those next week. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH. All right, next article. Um, G'day to Mitch. VK3ZT has joined the chat room. Uh, the VCL factor is there. G'day Wayne. Stephen, yep, okay. And you're saying huge difference this week. <laughs> oh, well, it's good to hear. Thanks, Wayne. Um, okay, this is a quick question. Oh, my, my neck is stiff tonight. I don't know why, but oh, must be the way I'm sitting. Uh, <clears throat> this is a question that comes in from Dale Miller of Springfield, Iho, 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 that place in USA. Uh, when stars go supernova, do they all produce the same heavy elements? How do the percentages compare for these elements in each star is the question. And the answer is, isn't it amazing that the heavy elements we see here on Earth were created by stars going supernova? The short answer to your question is that different kinds of supernova are caused by different kinds of stars depending on their mass and type. These stars disperse different elements into the universe. To look a bit deeper into the answer, let's, ex let's examine the different types of supernovae. Broadly, there are two, those with relatively little hydrogen in their explosions, type 1, and those with a lot of hydrogen, type 2. Of the type 1 supernovae, there are three types, three subtypes, 1A and 1B and 1C. Type 1A supernovae are caused by the thermal runaway process, and this happens when a star with roughly the mass of the Sun dies and leaves behind a white dwarf star rich in carbon and oxygen. If it is in a binary system, the white dwarf will start stealing gas and dust from its populate from its companion and heat up. Eventually, the white dwarf will heat up so much that the carbon fusion is ignited and it goes supernova. Type 1A supernovae populate the surrounding environment with lots of carbon, as well as silicon, nickel and elements up to iron. Types 1B and 1C and type 2 supernova are caused by the core collapse process that happens when stars with masses greater than eight times the mass of our sun end their lives. Generally, very massive stars, around 30 times that of the sun, create the hydrogen poor type 1B and 1C supernova while stars between 8 and 30 times the mass of the Sun create hydrogen-rich type 2 supernovae. While core collapse supernovae also populate the surrounding environment with elements up to iron, they generally do so in much lower quantities compared with type 1A supernova. Instead, they primarily eject elements heavier than zinc and are one of the main sources in the universe for creating these elements. There it is, that's a decent answer. Actually, I was meant to show, there's a little picture associated with that article. Let me just uh, crop that up. Um, believe it or not, I didn't put that through either. Where was I? Oh, my goodness me, just bear with me for a tick. I do have it saved, I did download it, I just didn't put it into vMix. So there it is. Okay, all right. That is a real image of a supernova, the remnants of a uh, exploded supernova. Let me go to the description. Uh, this is looking in Cassiopeia A. This is a northern sky object. 
Uh, Cassiopeia A was a type 2 super, supernova. And uh, what you're looking at on the screen for those watching vi video, uh, this is composite image. This is this composite image shows in different colors several elements detected within the remnant. Uh, it, the orange colors are predominantly iron. The purple color in the supernova is oxygen, and the light blue color is titanium. And the amount of silicon compared to magnesium is green. Background stars and galaxies appear in yellow. Isn't that interesting? Looks pretty good on the TV here. <laughs> All right. You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night cast missions. All right, next. There's a hungry black hole, <laughs> which is switches on or switching on as astronomers watch in surprise. This is just published 15 hours ago, and I hope I've got the picture of that there. Did I bring that across? Goodness gracious me, I didn't even bring that one across. Oh dear me, um, I thought I was doing pretty good with all these images that I uh, I downloaded. So uh, putting that up on screen as I speak, and it's really just a, an artist's illustration. It's not nothing real. So for those watching YouTube and TV, uh, you're looking at an illustration that shows a feeding supermassive black hole spaghettifying and feeding on an unfortunate star while blasting out jet twin jets of material. Okay, the article goes, and it's a short article, relatively short. Um, uh, yeah, righto. J221951. J221951 is one of the most extreme examples yet of a black hole taking us by surprise, astronomers say. One of the brightest transient events is the result of a supermassive black hole beginning to feast on surrounding matter resulting in one of the most dramatic switching on events ever seen. Transients are astronomical events or objects that change in brightness over short periods of time and the one powered by this greedy black hole J221951 is one of the brightest transients ever recorded. Transients. The position of the black hole corresponds with the centre of a previously observed galaxy but where a supermassive black hole would be expected to sit. However, astronomers still aren't sure exactly what is causing the transit event witnessed in J221951. Our understanding of the different things that mass supermassive black holes can do has greatly expanded in recent years with discoveries of stars being torn apart and accreting black holes and hugely variable luminosities, team member and University of Belfast astronomer Matt Nicole said in a statement, J221951 is one of the most extreme examples yet of a black hole taking us by surprise. The nature of what the supermassive black hole located around 10 billion light years away is consuming is currently unknown. But it is possible that J221951 represents a star that has ventured too close to the black hole being violently ripped apart by tidal forces arising from its immense gravity and in a process called spetification. This occurrence, <coughs> this occurrence, called a tidal disruption event, TDE, would see some of the stellar material from the dis from the destroyed star fall to the surface of the black hole while other matter is funneled to the poles of the black hole before being blasted out at near speed light speeds generating an intense electromagnetic radiation. The spedification of, an, ob of uh, an unfortunate star isn't the only possible mechanism that could be causing the black hole in question to give rise to its bright transient event. However, 
Another possibility is that J22-1951 is the result of the nucleus at the heart of a galaxy switching from a dormant to an active state. Active galactic nuclei, AGNs, are bright areas at the heart of galaxies that blast out enough light to drown out the combined light of every star in the rest of that galaxy. They are also powered by supermassive black holes. Continued monitoring of J22-1951 to work out the total energy release might, take, might, might uh, allow us to work out whether this is a tidal disruption of a star by a fast spinning black hole or a new kind of AGN switch on, Nicole said. Kilo novas are a type of transient event that occurs during the merger of two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole which releases bright bursts of electromagnetic radiation. Kilo novas initially have a blue coloration then fade to red over a period of several days. The transient J22-1951 also appeared blue but it didn't change to red or fade rapidly as a kilo nova would. The nature of this transient was determined by follow-ups with space-based facilities like the Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based observatories like the Very Large Telescope located at the Akakama Desert in North Chile. The key discovery was when the ultraviolet UV spectrum from Hubble ruled out a galactic origin. And this shows how important it is to maintain a space-based UV spectrograph capability for the future. Team member and Mullard Space Science Laboratory University College London researcher Paul Kewen said, <laughs> With a source located 10 billion light years away, the team realised that J22-1951 must be one of the brightest events ever seen, and they will, now, they will now work to better understand its cause. In the future, we will be able to obtain important clues that help distinguish between the tidal disruption event and active galactic nuclei scenarios, he said. For instance, if J22-1951 is associated with an AGN turning on, we may accept, expect uh, it to stop fading and to increase again in brightness, while if J22-1951 is a tidal disruption event, we would expect it to continue to fade. So they will continue to monitor this and see what happens over time. Uh, it keeps astronomers busy, doesn't it? All right, uh, next article. Let's me just go there for a second. Open VMix back to me for a second. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. All right, now I should have this image here. <laughs> oh my goodness, I must have been thinking of something else. All right, I do have it saved. I did download it, and there it is, but I just didn't transition it across to vMix. I don't know what went wrong with me tonight. All right. <sighs> dumpty, dumpty, dump. SpaceX, Starlink, Internet satellites, leak, so much radiation that it's hurting radio astronomy scientists say, published 19 hours ago. Starlink satellites can disturb observation even of those telescopes protected by quiet radio zones or radio quiet zones. The image was got, uh, I've got on the screen here, uh, of course, is a uh, um, well, yes, it's got to be a, a, a illustration, but what it's uh, what it's basically illustrating is that uh, the LOFAR radio astronomy array in the Netherlands can detect electronic hum from Starlink satellites, raising concerns about the mega constellations' impact on radio astronomy. <sighs> right, hum from onboard electronics that power SpaceX internet beaming Starlink satellites may disturb radio astronomy observations, a new study has found. 
Experts have long warned about how astronomy is being impacted by mega constellations of low Earth orbit satellites such as SpaceX, Starlink. The streaks those the the streaks those satellites leave in the astronomical images mar, observa mar observations of, of telescopes even with the most remote locations. The reflection of sunlight from these satellites might lead to an unwanted brightening of the night sky, even in areas far away from urban light pollution, and the radio waves these satellites use to carry out their communications could hamper the observations of sensitive radio telescopes. But a new unexpected source of scientific disturbance has now emerged thanks to a new study conducted by researchers using the Low Frequency Array LOFAR, telescopes in the Netherlands. Radiation from onboard electronics inside Starlink satellites. LOFAR is a network of over 40 radio antennas spread across the Netherlands, Germany and other European countries. The telescope is capable of detecting the longest wavelengths of radiation emitted by objects in the cosmos. However, as it transpires, radio frequencies similar to those LOFAR, those LOFAR is designed to detect are also unintentionally emitted by Starlink satellites. In the new study, the researchers described detecting this unwanted low frequency radio hum from nearly 50 Starlink spacecraft. With LOFAR, we detect radiation between 110 and 118 MHz from 47 out of 68 satellites that were observed. Cs Bassa, this is somebody's name, Cs Bassa, C -E -E -S. I mean, <laughs> Cs Bassa, an astronomer at the Netherlands Institute of Radio Astronomy, Astron, uh, which manages the LOFAR array and a co-author of recent paper said in a statement this frequency range includes a protected band between 150.05 to 153 MHz specifically located to radio astronomy by the International Telecommunications Union. The finding is of concern to the next generation large scale radio observatories such as the Square Kilometre Array Observatory which is currently being built in two remote sites in Australia and South Africa. To maximise the telescope's ability to detect even the faintest signals, regulators have placed radio quiet zones around the sites where no cellular telephone or terrestrial TV or radio use is allowed. Starlink and the other internet beaming satellite constellations however can freely travel over these in locations and due to their low altitude disturb observations. The Astron team added in their statement that SpaceX is not in breach of any rules as this kind of radiation from satellites is not regulated by any guidelines unlike that of terrestrial devices. This study represents the latest effort to better understand satellite constellations impact on radio astronomy. The study lead author and SKO, SKAO spectrum manager Federico Di Verano said in the statement, previous, previous workshops on dark and quiet skies theorized about this radiation, our observations confirm it is measurable. The researchers further modelled the impact of this unintended radiation from a large number of satellites. The simulations showed that the unwanted effects would become more pronounced with the constellation size. Our simulations show that the larger the constellation, the more important this effect becomes, as the radiation from all satellites just simply adds up. And uh, this makes, makes us not only worried about the existing constellations, but even more about the planned ones, and also about the absence of clear regulation that, that protects the radio astronomy bands from unintended radiation. The authors added that SpaceX is collaborating with astronomers in search for solutions that would enable the constellations and astronomy to coexist with negative impacts. SpaceX has already launched well over 4,000 Starlink satellites, according to the Astrophysicist and Satellite Tracker. 
The company already has regular approval to deploy another 12,000 of the broadband communication satellites and has filed for approval to launch another 30,000 Starlink craft. Boy, oh boy. The sky is going to be a mess of these uh, satellites. A real mess. Uh, this is VK3EKH. And I'm just trying to work up my next article. Oh yeah, okay. Well, this is this is just my little ad, my little plug um, for Brendan. So where is my page for that? There it is. Okay. <laughs> I should do a uh, a little commercial thing. Not a, not a commercial, but it's something that sounds like it. Anyway, like I've said, uh, you're all aware of Brendan O'Brien's. Um, uh, podcast website astrophys.com and uh, one of the uh, one of the best astronomy podcasts uh, around and uh, on the screen there you can see just a handful less than a handful of uh, of uh, astronomers there who have uh, provided their time for a interview with Brendan and uh, I highly recommend that if you've got a spare half an hour to an hour just tune in to the astrophys.com and um and have a listen to one of the podcasts. And, of course, the most recent podcast, Astrophys 173, Podcast 173, is Dr. Jesse Van De Sandy. I think that's how you'd pronounce that. Uh, and his topic is New Galactic Discoveries. So there it is. Thanks, Brennan. Um, all right. Now, time is escaping. I can see that. So... Um, let me just see what uh, I had next to bring up. Okay, how quick's that article? Oh, it's a short article. Uh, Lucid, this is published June 30 on, uh, what site is it? Astronomy.com. Lucid set to blast off to unravel the mystery of dark energy. The space mission will study 10 billion years of cosmic history to understand why our universe's expansion is accelerating. The universe's expansion is speeding up, and astrophysicists want to know why. On July 1st, the European Space Agency is set to launch a new space telescope. Lucid, with contributions from NASA, the mission will seek to understand the unknown cause for the accelerating expansion, called dark energy, and its effects on the evolution of our universe. The Lucid spacecraft measures about 14.5 feet, or 4.4 metres long, or about the average size of a canoe, and houses a 1.2 metre telescope. It will catch a ride to space aboard SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket uh, from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Actually, I've got an image of that too. Did I bring it across? Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, so, Lucid's launch will be visible. Sorry, L Lucid's launch will be live streamed on ESA's YouTube page and ESA's TV Web TV. Uh, after the launch, Lucid will follow a course to its final orbital location, and the Sun at the location of the Sun Earth Lagrange point L2. Uh, this is also where James Webb Space Telescope orbits. It will take Lucid about four weeks to get to L2, which is located about 1.5 million kilometres from Earth, where the craft will face away from the Sun. Once in orbit, the mission operators will turn on and verify that Lucid's two instruments are functioning. Lucid's team will calibrate the telescope and prepare for observations one to three months after launch. The mission will create the universe's largest, most accurate 3D map, by observing billions of galaxies out to a distance of 10 billion light years. In total, Lucid will survey more than a third of the sky. With these observations, scientists will piece together how and how how and large scale structures of the universe have expanded over time. The mission also aims to uncover more about gravity's role in the universe and the behavior of dark energy and dark matter. So, yes, there's a bit more to that, but I'm just going to leave that there. And uh, another little one here, and I think I brought that picture across. Yes, here it is. Um, this one you're seeing on the screen right now. 
uh, NASA humanoid robot to be tested in Australia. Australia. Uh, NASA's um, Valkari robot is beginning a new mission half a world away from its home at the agency Johnson Space Center in Houston <clears throat> as part of the Reimbursable Space Act agreement with Woodside Energy in Perth, Western Australia. NASA plans to use Valkiri robot to develop remote mobile dexterous manipulation capabilities to accommodate remote caretaking of uncrewed and offshore energy facilities. Uh, Woodside Energy will test the resulting software and provide data and feedback to NASA helping accelerate the maturation of robotic technologies. Now there's a lot more to that article but that's where I'm just going to leave that. That was courtesy of the Space Exploration Astronomical Society page. Um, thanks Kate if you're listening. And the next article, just zipping through these ones quickly. <laughs> and this is potentially interesting. I'll see if I can get through this before 11 o'clock. And I think I've got all this brought across. Okay, here's a picture of the moon. <clears throat> Uh, the moon, moon heat anomaly appears to be new form of lunar volcanism, July 7. A massive blob of ancient granite has been found lurking beneath the moon's surface, evidence of a type of volcanism we've never seen here or there before. <laughs> Analysis suggests it's a deeply buried giant mass of solidified magma, or bathio, bathyolith, deposited some three and a half billion years ago. We see this on Earth fairly frequently, but planetary scientists are excited to observe it on the Moon. Any big body of granite that we find on Earth caused, used, sorry, used to feed a big bunch of volcanoes, much like a large system is feeding the Cascade volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest today, says planetary scientist Matthew Sliger of the Southern Methodist University and Planetary Science Institute. Bath elifts are much bigger than the volcanoes they feed on the surface. For example, the Sierra Nevada mountains are a bath elith uh, left from a volcanic chain in the western United States that existed long ago. Um, and the image on the on the screen at the moment is the region of the moon where this, what they call a Campton um, Belovich volcanic complex, can be found. And of course, the next image is a uh, is a color treated image. Um, and uh, uh, th this is what you call the uh, Compton Belovich hotspot. Right. Granite is abundant on Earth, but extremely rare elsewhere in the solar system, since it requires specific conditions to form. <clears throat> Those conditions include a lot of liquid water and plate tectonics, which help melt and recycle material in the planet's crust. Granite production requires multi-stage remelting of Balsac rock, or crystal fractioning, uh, fractionation in liquid basalt. The Moon has neither liquid water nor plate tectonics. Yet beneath a volcanic region known as the Compton Belovich, um, close to the North Pole on the Moon's far side, uh, microwave instruments on China's Change 1 uh, and Change 2 orbiters picked up something strange. They detected anomalous heat around 20 times higher than the average for the lunar highlands. Uh, the researchers were able to analyze the publicly available data from the China National Space Admission Administration and the findings surprised them. What we found was that one of these suspected volcanoes known as the Compton Belovich uh, was absolutely growing at, at microwave wavelengths and uh, what this means is that it is hot, not necessarily at the surface as you would see in the infrared but under the surface. So the only way to explain this is from an extra heat uh, uh, coming from somewhere below the feature within a deep, deep lunar crust. So the so Compton Belovich, thought to be a volcano, is also hiding a large heat source below it. And there's just one more image that uh, that sort of illustrates this. And I'll just bring that up. 
oops, click again and do it again and it's not going to go across. Why isn't it going to go across? <laughs> there we are, it decided to finally do it. Uh, so, finally, Compton Belkovich is notable because the region contains a great deal of theorem, a product of radioactive decay. The analysis conducted by Seeger and his colleagues indicate that the radioactive elements in a granite matrix are likely the source of the heat beneath it. The granite matrix is much larger uh, than what they would expect to, around 50 kilometers across. This, the researchers say, is evidence of an evolved magma pluming system, plumbing, plumbing system, which uh, are much larger than expected for the moon. A, uh, a system this large needs one of three things, a large mantle plume feeding in magma from within the moon uh, and anomalously, an anomalously wet pocket inside the moon in that location, or a patch of elements that could provide an, enough radiogenetic, radiogenic material to produce enough heat for constant remelting. All three imply large-scale conversational inconsistencies within the moon that need to be explained. <clears throat> if you don't have if you if you don't have water, it takes extreme situations to make granite. So here's the system with no water and no plate tectonics, but you have granite. So <laughs> so uh, um, yeah. So they're they're exploring that one. Interesting. All right, uh, now we've gone 11 o'clock already, so I shall leave that article to next week, and I shall pick up spaceweather.com. Um, there's the sun. The solar wind is currently at 487.7 kilometers a second at a density of 4.89 protons per cubic centimeter. The current disk of the sun on screen as we speak has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sunspots on its surface at the moment. Uh, the sun's current sunspot number is 149, and the radio sun is a currently a currently 158 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. 158 solar flux units. Uh, the KP index is currently 3.67, which is considered quiet. And uh, over the next 24-hour period, the max has been the same figure. KP equals 3.67, which is considered quiet. The uh, There is a little bit of a auroral activity occurring over the South Pole as we speak. Uh, there it is. So if you were down south in Tasmania... Hobart side of town, um, you might have seen some sort of activity low on the horizon tonight if the sky is clear. But uh, yes, there is a significant amount of activity going on there tonight. Uh, now, um, there is a geomagnetic storm watch. Uh, NOAA, NOAA forecasters say that, that uh, G1 class geomagnetic storms are possible on July 7. Uh, when a partial radio, sorry, a partial halo CME is expected to hit Earth's magnetic field. It was hurled in our direction July 4 by an explosion in the magnetic canopy of sunspot AR3359. So, uh, so this tomorrow, uh, today and tomorrow, you should see some, maybe some interesting effects on our radio bands. Tamitha hasn't released any report, in her current report, so uh, we haven't got anything from Tamitha at the moment, at least. Um, okay, now this last thing here on uh, the uh, spaceweather.com is this image. And what you're looking at there is an image of the sun taken from the surface of the moon. And they say here that a sunspot so big you can see it from Mars. A huge sunspot, AR3363, just merged over the sun's southeastern limb. But the Mars rover Perseverance saw it before we did. On July 2nd, the rover's mast-mounted stereo camera, Mastcam Z, tilted up to the sky above Jazeera uh, Crater and photographed a deep black dot 
on the solar disk and that's what you're seeing on the screen there a sunspot taken from the surface of Mars perseverance does this all of time however uh, using a solar filter the rover looks at the Sun almost daily to check its brightness and um, when the Sun dims researchers know a dust storm is brewing one of the most important forms of weather on the red planet sunspots are just a bonus a recent study shows that Perseverance sees more than 40% of all sunspots despite the fact that Mars is 78 million kilometres farther from the Sun than Earth. And the rover's cameras doesn't put many pixels across the solar disk. It is able to resolve about 10% of the biggest sunspots into multiple pixels. Perseverance has one big advantage. It can see parts of the Sun we cannot. Uh, from where Mars is currently located, Perseverance views more than half the Sun's far side, giving it a preview of sunspots still hidden from Earth. And that's how the rover spotted AR 3363 days in advance. People on Earth saw the sunspot for the first time on July 5, which is uh, in this image here, I believe. And here it is. And that image there show, gives you also the size of Earth in comparison to that sunspot. It's pretty big. A very big sunspot is coming. So, um, yeah, there it is. Anyway, comparison to uh, good old Earth. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, <clears throat> where on the 5th of July 2003... That's not the date I wanted. On the 7th of July, 2023, there are 2,335 potentially hazardous asteroids. So, uh, but none of them are, of course, th going to threaten us here on Earth at this point in time. Okay, ladies and gents, g'day to Bill, VK3KHT. It's also joined in there too. S9 in upper plenty. And uh, thank you, Bill. I gather you'd be watching the TV as well. Okay. On that note, I shall conclude tonight's broadcast. Um, thank you very much for uh, listening and watching. Um, to everybody up there who's sent in emails, thank you very much, Lee. And uh, to all the folks on the Discord chat window, um, thanks for all for tuning in and saying hi. I can see that Richard VK3VRS is still uh, out. He's have been having some house renovations going on, which has uh, uh, completely dis uh, dis uh, removed his radio shack to, uh, to for the house renovation. So he's obviously still off air. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, this is uh, uh, VK3EKH um, AS for radio. We're now going to see if there's any stations wishing to to check in for tonight and uh, I'm just getting my logbook here ready and my pen ready and this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 VK3 GL, VK3 DX, VK3 SPX, any other stations? VK3 Bravo, you're good to go. Yep, we got VK3 BSF and there was a VK2 pretty weak, but try again. VK2 Victor Mike Golf. VK2 Victor Mike Golf, VK2. Victor Mike Golf. <laughs> okay, we got you that time. Thank you. And any other stations? VK3 EKH. Okay, we got Martin. All right. So let's pick up Graham at Bunyip. VK7, sorry, VK3 GL. Uh, it's catching up with me. VK3 GL, VK3 CSJ, uh, EKH. Good evening, uh, Graham.
Yeah, thanks, Graham. VK3GL, VK3EKH. Yes, there was a, a, a so-called uh, supermoon, or blue moon, super moon, blue moon, um, <coughs> which was, I believe was Wednesday. And uh, I, I think I was making my cup of coffee at uh, my regular 10 o'clock uh, cup of coffee, and I could see this moon through the trees, through the kitchen window, uh, <laughs> amongst the clouds. So, But I had no idea that it was at its closest approach, so there it is. But yeah, uh, and of course there, there would have been enough ice crystals in the uh, atmosphere to create that halo too, given the, the weather conditions at the moment. Uh, thanks, Gray. Um I may or may not be around afterwards as soon as I finish. Uh, I um, I might hang around just for a few minutes, but uh, I'm making a trip to Geelong tomorrow, so um, I want to feel a little bit refreshed for that long journey. It's going to be... Uh, the weather's not going to be really conducive of driving out an hour and a half, and I'm not looking forward to dealing with the Westgate Bridge and all the roadworks going on. So I just hope I don't get lost. That's another question, uh, another story. Um, Greg, VK3 Delta X-ray, a bit better signal to, to today compared to uh, last Friday. Um, VK3 DX, VK3 EKH. Good on you, Greg. VK3 Delta X-ray, VK3 EKH. Yes, you're, you're uh, 20 to 25 over here. Uh, far better than uh, last week. 80 metres had just completely fallen over uh, last week. So, <laughs> um, But uh, the band seems to be holding in uh, right now, So, uh, which is really, really good. Yeah, okay, thanks, Greg. Um, uh, Steve, VK3 SPX, uh, good signal from you too, VK3 EKH. Thanks, Steve. VK3 SPX, VK3 EKH. Very good. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I, t- I agree. The, uh, the the population of uh, the satellites in orbit, uh, especially low Earth orbiting, you know, both, both from an optical point of view and from an RF point of view, is, ju- is just getting worse. And, um, uh, you know, the the technology that radio astronomers are employing to... to distinguish between what's man-made and what's coming in from the universe is uh, 
is I think being stretched to its uh, its limits. Uh, but um, uh, fortunately, there are systems in place that uh, look at the the sky now and 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 uh, they're, they're checking for this interfering factor. And when they do absolute, when they are doing radio uh, observations, uh, if there's any unknown signal that's being detected, they can quickly uh, make a determination as to whether that's man-made or uh, or something else. It's it's that sort of thing, but it's an ongoing uh, process, and uh, it's uh, it's just it's just going to get any harder for them. That's for sure. That that's why they they're thinking that uh, creating uh, observatories on the on the other side of the moon is just about the uh, the last uh, uh, place where to to set up a radio telescope. That's it's major engineering, and uh, we'll probably never see it in in my lifetime. But uh, um, if they if they're pretty serious about uh, studying the universe in in radio, and uh, that might be the only winning ticket is to uh, to do that. Oh well, that's we'll. we'll See what goes on. If there's any news, we'll, you'll hear it first on ASV Radio. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, okay, Peter, VK3BSF, uh, our local station, VK3EKH. Go ahead, mate. Yeah, thanks, Pete. <laughs> VK3 BSF, VK3 EKH. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, I think the uh, the the rings around the uh, the moon and the, and um, uh, uh, yeah, generally it's the moon uh, is really just a, a form of uh, ice crystals. There's uh, a lot of uh, high altitude uh, ice in the sky, and um, it's just the light uh, uh, from the moon. Um, diffracting through the, I think that's the right word, through by the ice crystals and uh, just creating a, a halo effect around the moon. Sometimes you can get some very interesting um, uh, effects from that. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, I've seen it once or twice, so uh, fairly interesting stuff. Um, not very strong, uh, but I, I would have thought that you would have been a bit stronger, but uh, you're sort of hovering around 10 over 9, so for a, a local lad... Um, you should have been a bit stronger, but it doesn't matter. I'm hearing you, that's the main thing. Uh, and, uh, I think you said something about a haircut. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, uh, it, it'll continue to grow to a point where it'll irritate me. So, uh, it, my next haircut will probably be due in December. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, haircuts are, uh, one of those things I just don't worry about. Uh, now we have a, a VK2 that's called in before. Let's hope the uh, the signal holds in. Uh, VK2 Victor Mike Golf VK2 VMG. If you're still there, VK3 EKH. Go ahead. Oh, that's better. Huh? <laughs> uh, VK2 uh, VK2 VMG VK3 EKH. You there, mate? Oh, maybe not. All right. Um, maybe he was just checking in. Uh, Martin, VK7JAH, have a say, VK3EKH. Uh, VK3EKH, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. 
Yeah, no worries, Martin. VK seven JAH Launceston VK three EKH returning. Very good. No good signal coming in across the straight today. Um, <clears throat> far better than last week. Although you weren't doing that bad last week compared to everybody else. But uh, no, it's good. Uh, good steady signal tonight. And uh, hearing you without uh, too many issues. Uh, fortunately, there's not uh, much in the way of uh, lightning activity going on, so it's uh, it's fairly quiet. In fact, the <laughs> the way the band sounds, it's uh, it, it almost it could be dead, but it's obviously the propagation's there, which is good. But um, yes, with with this pending launch of uh, more satellites, twelve thousand, and then another thirty thousand, how, how how can they do that? How can they launch so so many of these objects <clears throat> into uh, low Earth orbit? Um, it's um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> just mind-boggling. Anyway, I, I believe that the uh, a lot of these low-Earth orbiting satellites that SpaceX are putting up are only have a lifespan of about five years, um, five or seven years, when they deorbit them to be replaced. So it's not as if they're going to be up there for a long time. They're, I think there is, I think the intention is that uh, these satellites. Um, uh, will be de deliberately de deorbited um, after five years or so, uh, probably related to technology uh, upgrades uh, as in t technology improves. Um, it's it's probably better to to deorbit the satellite and put up a new one. <laughs> I don't know, but I think that's the idea behind it all. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there it is. We'll uh, we'll keep an eye on it. Thanks, Martin. Uh, is there anybody else wishing to check in tonight? VK3 EKH. Uh, go ahead, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH. Now, I don't know whether it was uh, um, a small problem with your uh, transmission or whether it was uh, some sort of QSB, <laughs> um, but um, you, your signal kept fading into the noise, and uh, but then would come back up to 15, 20 over 9 uh, for a, maybe uh, four or five words, and then it would sort of fall back into the noise again. So I don't know whether that was just fading. I'm not really hearing it on anybody else, or whether there was uh, something going on with uh, with your transmission there, Frank. Um, but um, yeah, I, I I I caught most of what you were saying, but it was a little bit interrupted by uh, the drop in signal. So I'm not sure what uh, what was going on there. Um, I think you said there was going to be a bit of a transmission on 160 later tonight, but it might be just a short, uh, a short session. I think that's uh, what you were saying. I'll just pop it quickly back to you, VK3JR, VK3EKH. Yeah,
Yeah, okay, thank, thanks very much for that. All right. I may or may not be around to listen to that, but we'll see. Uh, I've got I've got a, a planned uh, trip to uh, Geelong tomorrow. Uh, I've got to be in Geelong by about midday, so um, I really should try and get a bit of a, an early night. Normally, Friday Friday nights turn into uh, three or four o'clock mornings. So <laughs> I don't I don't want to do that. Um, all right, thanks, Frank. Good on you, mate. Thanks very much for checking in. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to, to tonight and for the viewers to the uh, TV and YouTube uh, side of things. Um, we'll be back doing the WIA broadcast Sunday morning on uh, 160 metres AM at 9 o'clock. So if you're having breakfast Sunday morning, Sunday morning and wish to hear an early session of the WIA broadcast before REC picks it up, uh, there's, a, there's a broadcast at 9 o'clock uh, on 1825 kilohertz AM coming from here. And uh, then I shall repeat the broadcast again on the TV at 10.30, uh, VK3R TV and via YouTube. This is the visual uh, 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 ver version of the broadcast, the video version. And then I'll repeat it again at 8 o'clock Sunday night. So I, I get a chance to sit three times through the broadcast in one day. Um, anyway, all right. Uh, on that note, this is VK3EKH concluding transmissions for tonight on 3541. And via the Melbourne TV repeater, we shall now close down. And everybody, please stay warm. And uh, we'll see you all next Friday once again. This is VK3EKH on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, broadcasting since 1988, uh, concluding for tonight. And uh, like I say, any, any more information about the ASV can be found at www.asv.org.au. And if there's anybody up at Heathcote, the Dark Sky site, watching on the TV up there in the club room, good evening to you. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Uh, just a sec, Dan. I'm, I'll just uh, finish up on the other streaming services that I've got here, and uh, then I'll pick you up on 80. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so for those folks watching on the TV, uh, we'll see you Sunday morning next time. And I hope you've enjoyed tonight's session uh, without a problem. And to everybody watching on YouTube, so cheers to everybody. Cheers to you there, Martin, Bill, Mitch, Remus, Steve, and everybody else. Astrophys, Brian, if you're still there, Mr. Mr. Astrophys. And uh, we'll see you all next, uh, next week. Take care. Look after yourselves. This is VK3EKH ASV Radio over and out on the system.